Hello, everyone. Welcome to the STOA. Today we have with us Lee Brassington, the author of a wonderful book on the jhanas um, called The uh, Right Concentration, a Practical Guide to the Jhanas. So thank you, Lee, for joining us. Um, the format of today is uh, Lee's going to uh, speak for some time uh, on this topic, and then I'll have a brief conversation with him, at which point we'll open it up for Q&A from everyone. So if you have a question at any time, please feel free to put your question in the chat, mark the question with a Q or question so we know it's a question. And um, when the time comes, we will call on you and you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. If you don't want to be on YouTube because this is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube, then uh, please signal that by writing in the chat that you'd like to have the question read on your behalf and I will read the question for you. So with that, uh, welcome to the Stoically. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Evan. It's very nice to be here. Of course, all I see are people's names. So uh, it's easier to talk to people as opposed to their names. So if you wanna turn yourself on and don't mind being recorded for YouTube, that would be nice. All righty. So, the jhanas. The jhanas are eight altered states of consciousness that are brought on by concentration and each one yields more concentration. So they're a method for generating good concentration. So the first thing to say is the concentration is a translation of the Pali word samadhi. Concentration is not bad, but it does have that furrowed brow connotation to it. Actually, I think a better translation would be indistractability, which may not even be a real word, but it really captures what's implied. That is the ability to put your mind on a topic and not become distracted. So that's what the jhanas are used for, is to generate a mind like that. The reason for doing that, well, the Buddha talked about sila, samadhi, and panya. Sila is morality. That practice would be the five precepts, don't kill, don't steal, don't misuse your sexual energy. Don't engage in wrong speech, lying, harsh speech, divisive speech, idle chatter, and don't indulge in intoxicants. <laughs> My teacher said, we are confused enough already. We don't need to ingest something to make us even more confused. I found that actually quite helpful. And then there's samadhi, concentrating your mind, generating indistractability, so that right after you've generated a very sharp mind, you can investigate reality well enough to actually experience what's truly happening. It's usually called knowing and seeing things as they are. I prefer um, knowing and seeing what's actually happening because <laughs> the world is made up of verbs. And so it's not things, it's processes. So basically clean up your act, learn to concentrate, use your concentrated mind to investigate reality. If you have a better idea of how reality functions, you can act in harmony with that. And there's less dukkha, which is what the Buddha said he was all about. I teach only dukkha and the end of dukkha, he said on multiple occasions. So these jhanas, as I mentioned, there are eight of them. They require a certain level of concentration before you can enter them, before you have access to them. This goes by the name access concentration. There are numerous ways to generate access concentration. Um, the commentaries mention 30 different ways. Mm. The ones that I've worked with and had students work with would be mindfulness of breathing, loving kindness meditation, meta meditation, uh, the body scan, Mr. Goenka has made that famous in the West, a mantra, and the nada sound, which comes from Ajahn Sumedho. 
any of these will, in, when done sufficiently, will get you to access concentration, which we could define as being fully with the, your object of meditation, such that if there are thoughts, they don't pull you off into distraction. For example, if you're working with the breath, you know each in-breath, you know each out-breath, and thoughts are wispy and in the background, and you don't become distracted. But there might be something like, okay, this is working. This is what he's talking about. As opposed to, when I get to Hawaii, the first thing I'm going to do is, or whatever your favorite distraction is. It usually takes people some time to generate access concentration at home. Maybe it takes quite a while because of all the slings and arrows of outrageous 21st century Western civilization. Maybe when you're on retreat, you can get to access concentration rather quickly. Hopefully so at least after a few days of being on retreat. Once you've arrived at access concentration, you wanna stay there for a while. You wanna let it build. And then if you want to enter the first jhana, there's a trick. And the trick is to switch your attention to some pleasant sensation, preferably a pleasant physical sensation. And just focus on that pleasant sensation. Drop the attention on the breath or the metta or the body scan or your mantra or whatever, and just enjoy the pleasantness of the pleasant sensation. If you can do so without becoming distracted, then it will start a positive feedback loop. Uh, you all know positive feedback loop. If I had a microphone and I held it up to the speaker, it would make that horrible sound. That's a negative positive feedback loop, negative in the sense that it's unpleasant. What you're trying to do is hold your mind up to, to some pleasure. And if you can do that undistractedly, then yeah, it's pleasant, which will add a little more pleasure. Adding a little more pleasure, well, that's even more pleasant, which adds a little more pleasure. All right, you get the idea. You're setting up a positive feedback loop of pleasure. If you don't disturb it, if you don't go commenting on it or anything, then it will turn into the first jhana. It will erupt into, well, piti and sukha, which are the primary components of the first jhana. Piti is often translated as rapture and sukha translated as joy or happiness. Actually, I prefer to translate piti as glee. It's a physical release of uplifting, pleasant energy. At least, hopefully, it's pleasant. And sukha, well, that's the opposite of dukkha. That's, that's joy, happiness. It's an emotionally positive state. And you get both of these, the physical, energetic experience and the emotional, pleasant, joyful experience. If you can sustain that experience and sustain your attention upon that experience, then I say you have arrived at the first jhana. All right. The PT may be mild, in which case you maybe stay in the first jhana five or 10 minutes, or it could be very intense, you know, blows the top of your head off. If it's really intense, it may be so pleasant, it's not even pleasant. It's just too much, in which case you may not stay very long in that first jhana. Uh, once you're skilled at it, yeah, maybe 10, 20, 30 seconds is enough. The, the primary purpose of the first jhana is to get you to the second jhana. The move to the second jhana is basically to calm things down. Take a nice deep breath. And as you let the energy out, put your attention on the emotional sense of joy, happiness on the sukha. As you let the breath out on that exhale, the PT, the physical, will calm down. You'll be basically doing a foreground, background shift. 
the, the PT calms down, goes into the background, and now the sukha is more obvious and you can focus on it. And so the object of the second jhana becomes the emotional state of joy, happiness. There's background PT, background sense of energy may cause you to sway a bit or maybe some rocking, but it doesn't have the vibratory, uh, energetic, strong feeling that you would have in the first jhana. Also, things get quieter. Um, the background thinking that you had in access concentration may still be there in the first jhana, but with a good second jhana, the background thinking gets very quiet. Ideally, it goes away completely. Uh, you're probably gonna need to be on a long retreat to get that deep, but it definitely calms down. And now you just hang out focused on the sukha the joy, happiness. You can stay in this state for, yeah, quite a long time. The first jhana, all that energy, yeah, more than 10 minutes is probably counterproductive, but any of the other jhanas, yeah, you can stay as long, well, as your concentration will allow you to be there. When you're learning them, I tell students, yeah, stay there 10 to 15 minutes. Of course, your time sense is totally messed up, but never mind but stay for a while, and then you can move on to the third jhana. Again, you can take a deep breath, and now you want the PT to go away completely, and you're left just with the sukha, not so much as joy, happiness, but more as contentment, wishlessness, uh, satisfaction. Satisfaction so profound that if Mick Jagger had been practicing the third jhana, he wouldn't be able to sing that song. All right, you are just satisfied. And so now you're focused on satisfaction. Because the PT has gone away completely, it's a very still place. There's no sense of movement. It's still pleasant. I mean, being satisfied, being contented is a pleasant state. And you hang out there for 10 to 15 minutes. And then you can move on to the fourth jhana. The move to the fourth jhana is to let go of the pleasure. Again, take a deep breath, let everything calm down further, and you'll probably find there's a sense of things dropping down. Just go with that dropping down and let it drop down to quiet stillness. Often the fourth jhana is referred to as the jhana of equanimity. But if I tell you, focus on equanimity, uh, maybe that's a little nebulous, hard to focus on. But if I tell you, focus on quiet stillness, if you succeed in doing that, then you will be focused on equanimity. So the move is basically let go of the pleasantness, the pleasure of the contentment of the third jhana, and just let yourself drop down to a very quiet, still place. As the numbers go one, two, three, four, what it feels like subjectively is you're going down, down from one, which maybe is in the head area, throat, spine maybe, but primarily around the face, drops down more towards the heart center for two, down towards the belly for three, and maybe below the four, below the floor for the fourth one. When you leave the fourth jhana, you have a mind that's concentrated, clear, sharp, bright, mabel, wieldy, and given to imperturbability, which you can then direct and incline to knowing and seeing. In particular, what you want to investigate is your mind and your body. If you're familiar with the four establishments of mindfulness, sometimes called the four foundations of mindfulness, the first one, <laughs> mindfulness of the body, and the next three, mindfulness of your mind. So basically the jhanas are a warm-up practice for investigating your mind and body or any other aspect of reality. It appears from the suttas that four jhanas are sufficient. In other words, coming out of jhana four, you do have enough 
concentration to actually have turbocharged your insight practice. But you could move on to the so-called higher jhanas, the immaterial states. They're quite different. The first four are, well, when I talk about them, they don't sound totally alien. The next ones are kind of weird. The fifth jhana is the realm of infinite space. Number six is the realm of infinite consciousness. Number seven is the realm of no thingness. And number eight is the realm of neither perception nor non-perception. I mean, basically you're experiencing more and more subtle states of mind. In the fifth one, the infinite space, you get there by imagining something and expanding it. And if you can stay focused on the expansion, then suddenly it will shift to where it appears you have stumbled into an infinite space. Focus on the spaciousness. The sixth jhana is to shift your attention from the spaciousness to your awareness of the spaciousness, become conscious of your consciousness. It's gotta be as big as the space was, so you have an infinite consciousness. The seventh jhana, no thingness. What's the content of this infinite consciousness? Well, there's nothing there. Focus on the sense of nothing. And the eighth jhana, neither perception or non-perception. Let go of the nothing and see if your mind will arrive in a state that has no characteristics by which you can describe it, yet you can stay there. <laughs> yeah, I know that's not very easy to understand what's going on, sorry. But yeah, once you're good at seven, it's actually fairly easy to find eight. Of course, to get good at seven, you gotta be good at five and four and all the rest of them. And as I said, these are a warm-up exercise for your investigation of reality. You sit down, you spend probably half your meditation period, if it's 45 minutes to an hour, getting really concentrated, hopefully by moving into at least some of these states. And then you spend the second half of your meditation period doing some sort of insight practice. The best insight practice to do is the one you want to do. Because if I tell you, oh, I think you should do this practice and you don't want to do it, yeah, it's not going to go as well as if you do one you want to do. So investigate reality. In particular, while investigating reality, you're looking for the impermanent, unsatisfactory, empty nature of phenomena. Insights into those three characteristics, anicca, dukkha, anatta, are the insights that are transformative. Okay, so that's the background. Evan? <clears throat> Thanks, that was a wonderful um, overview of the jhanas. So um, I'm gonna warm you up with a, a few questions of my own and then um, in maybe, <coughs> excuse me, 10 minutes or so, we will uh, open up the floor to anyone. So uh, people, if you have questions, go ahead and start putting them in the chat and uh, we'll go ahead and I'll start out with, um, uh, well, I just want to make a remark. I really love your your translation of pity as glee. That that fills me with glee. So um, that that's wonderful. <laughs> and um, and so uh, um, I guess my first question will be one. Um, you know, there's a lot of controversy within um, the Buddhist circles, at least that I run in, um, about like sort of what counts as a jhana, as having attained a given jhana. And teachers will have standards. Um, you know something like, oh, you got to access concentration and kind of held that for a, a few moments. Cool. You, you tasted a jhana. And then other people say, no, you have to really, you know, one of the translations of jhanas is often meditative absorptions, right? You have to be fully absorbed in the jhana. So I'm wondering sort of where you come down in this sort of debate um, and, and, and specifically what you think is the most useful and skillful way for a practitioner to relate to when they've gotten enough of each of the first four jhanas um, that they can then move on to the progress of insight. Right. So the debate about what actually constitutes a jhana, which basically is how much concentration have you got to have before it's really a jhana, I think will never be resolved. 
okay? Every teacher basically says, I'm doing it correctly. And anyone who doesn't have as much concentration as what I'm teaching, there's, those aren't real jhanas. And anyone who has more than what I'm teaching, they're just indulging. So obviously do what I'm teaching. And this is consistent across all jhana teachers. So that's the only consistency we find. How much do you have to have? I would say as much as you can get without uh, passing the point of diminishing returns, right? So if you have an hour long sitting and you spend 59 minutes trying to get concentrated, uh, yeah, your returns on that are not gonna be very good. So I like to get to the point where the, jhana factors, as they're usually called, PT and sukha for the first, sukha and PT for the second, sukha without PT for the third, quiet stillness for the fourth, are stable and your attention on them is stable. In other words, you're not getting distracted. I'm not so worried about the background, you know, thoughts, ruminations, as long as you don't fall out of the state. What seems to be most important to me is what can you do? I mean, if, if the jhanas are at this high level and you can only do this, this doesn't do you any good at all if you just keep trying to get there and don't get there. Um, the, the subtitle, the, the original title for my book, Right Concentration, of course, publishers have other ideas always, was Practical Jhanas, right? And so here's something that a lay person can actually learn. You might have to go on a 10 day retreat or two week or a month long retreat to actually be able to learn them. But here's something that a lay person can learn that will enhance their insight practice. And if you can concentrate your mind to any degree and enhance your insight practice, that's good. Even if you're just getting to access concentration, that's going to be better than if you sit down and start your insight practice without trying to quiet your mind. So the level I'm after is whatever you can do. This makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. So um, sort of leads me to the second question I had for you. So um, something that's, again, been a pretty active topic of conversation in the Buddhist circles I frequent and, um, you know, uh, uh, I find quite interesting is the, uh, the book and, and practice that's been, um, you know, uh, shared by Daniel Ingram recently based on some of the older texts um, of Fire Casino as a, um, as a specific concentration practice. And so um, Daniel's a friend of the Stoa has, has been here a couple of times. And um, so I'm wondering, um, you know, I personally found that practice to be quite interesting and 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 kind of pretty useful for entering sort of uh, you know pretty pretty decent jhanic states pretty quickly compared to say my normal experience of mantra or breath as object. And so I'm wondering if you have thoughts on the sort of casino type um, practice, whether Daniel's fire casino in particular or just casino type practice in general as a, as an aid to concentration. I have not worked with casinos. Okay, so I can't give you my personal experience, but having talked to people who have worked with them, and of course, reading the literature, um, yeah, they seem to work. Casinas get mentioned in the Pali suttas, but only as a list. There's no discussion of them at all. And the suttas they show up in, I suspect, are later compositions. So yeah, uh, they seem to work. Um, the not a sound would be something that's not mentioned in the suttas and yet works quite well. The mantras, there's no mantras in the suttas, but yeah, they work quite well. So it's not like what's in the suttas is all that you can do, but yeah, you just have to play with the other techniques. Hopefully you find a teacher that's worked with it and can give you the hints about how to work with it, but yeah. Play with whatever you think might work and see if it does. 
Yeah. Um, my, my own personal experience with that was quite fascinating. I had been not in the practice of doing concentration meditation for several years due to, you know, strong work commitments and things like that. And I, I just tried the fire casino thing from Daniel's book and then boom, pop, it, it worked quite fast, brought back a lot of the stuff I had not been in since my last retreat. So I just thought that was fascinating. Um, so I guess, um, I'll ask you maybe one more question. Um, so, so one thing that I find can happen to people and to some extent happened to me for a while is, you know, um, that people will experience something that they at least call a jhana that maybe feels to them like a, a jhanic state. And this seems like it has some sort of potential for um, a sort of, well, at least psychological addictive quality to it. Um, and then, so I'm thinking about this in sort of a, a contrast to one of the articles you have on your website about the neurological correlates of the jhanas, um, which seems to make a pretty compelling case to me, that article, um, that the, the jhanic progression actually has to do with the sort of... Um, like loosening or, or um, uh, less stickiness of the sort of, um, you know, neurotransmitter systems uh, responsible for uh, addictive relationships, you know, that you talk about the substantia nigra, the ventral tegmental system, et cetera. And so I'm wondering if you can kind of help me untangle that knot as far as how some people seem to end up in a sort of addictive relationship with jhanic practice. And yet I, I do take up your model there that, uh, that this basically has something to do um, with with sort of uh you know uh, attenuating the the sort of addictive um centers of the brain right yeah the 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 draw to pleasant mental states is really strong um, so i stumbled into the first jhana uh on my second retreat i've been practicing for three years second retreat at uh wat swan mo buddha das's place in southern thailand and they could tell me I was experiencing PT. Uh, I didn't know it was a jhana, and I liked it. I liked it a lot. And so for the next two years, you know, it was meditate and get high. And if it succeeded, it was a great meditation. And if it didn't, it was like better luck next time. Uh, the problem with not knowing what you're doing. I did ask a number of teachers during that two-year period, uh, okay, so I get all this PT. What am I supposed to do with it? And I never got an answer that my, fit my experience. Uh, and being stubborn, I just ignored whatever they told me and went back to getting high. Two years after stumbling into the first John, I went on retreat with actually the teacher who was my very first teacher, Venerable Ayakema. And in the first interview, I told her I get to PT. And she's like, oh, good. That's the first John. Here's how you do the second. Somebody knew what was happening and what I was supposed to do. And yeah, there was an addictive quality to these states. I mean, it was no longer the pleasure as much as, well, the quiet of three and four and the otherworldliness of five. And yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't quite as addicted, but yeah, I was, I was just having fun playing with these states. And luckily, in another year, I went on another retreat with Ayakema, and this one was a one-week retreat followed by a one-month retreat, so five and a half weeks. And in that retreat, I learned jhanas six, seven, and eight. And once I got some skill with it, Ayakema says, now you have to do insight practice in the same sitting after the jhanas. And I was all like, yeah, but it takes me so long. And she's like, do them faster. Well, now I came up was not someone you wanted to argue with. It was, yes, ma'am, I'll go try that out right now. The insights I got were life-changing. You know, getting high had no more attraction. And I have discovered that basically my job as a teacher is to keep an eye on my students. And when I start seeing them get lost in jhana junkiness, uh, just make sure they start doing their insight practice. The insights into the nature of reality are so much more profound than any high you can get off of these states. So the neurological aspect of it, yeah, um, things quiet down, but you know, it's really nice to be quiet. So you can get addicted to the quiet of say third or fourth jhana. Um, if you don't know better 
and the better is the insights. Um, the amount of insights I got on that one month retreat totally overwhelmed both the quantity and the quality of all the insights I'd had in the previous six years. Just investigating reality with a jhanically concentrated mind. That's the cure for jhana junkiness. Wonderful answer. Thank you. So um, at this point, we've got some good questions in the chat. So um, let's see, uh, Kuram, would you like to unmute and ask your question? I'm not sure if I said the name right. Kuram Shazad? Um, or I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and ask it on your behalf. So the question is, um, who in your view is trying to do jhanas? Is it mainly with the perceived sense of self? Essentially, is there a suggested starting mind state? And a follow-up, what is your view on koans or glimpses as ways to get to certain states that you've described? So who's doing the jhanas? The jhanas are dualistic states. So yeah, there's a subject and an object. And so it's me, even though the me is an illusion. So it's the illusory me who's doing the jhana. Um, the jhanas do have some insights from actually being in them, but the real insights come afterwards. So the feeling is that I'm the one who's sitting down to meditate. You want the mind to be as quiet as possible probably not good to have just come back from a rock concert or something like that. You probably didn't want to watch your favorite football team lose the game. Or, I mean, you want a quiet mind when you sit down. Uh, and as you get more concentrated, the ego constructing, I mean, everybody's aware you have to construct your ego, think it up, emote it up, right? That ego constructing quiets down. By the time you're in the jhanas, the selfing is getting quite small and you're not thinking about, I'm in second jhana. You start doing that, it can tend to knock you out of it. It's just that, yeah, this experience is happening. Also, I should mention that you don't actually do the jhanas. You set up the conditions, particularly for the first one, the, the concentrated focus on pleasure and the jhana comes and finds you. But yeah, I, the illusory I is who it feels like is setting up the conditions. And then the second thing about koans, um, I have not worked with that. Um, can you read this last half of that question again about the koan? So the question is, um, what is your view on koans or glimpses as ways to get to certain states that you described? Yeah, uh, having some idea what pleasure feels like is, is certainly helpful. Having some idea what a quiet mind feels like. Um, more, it's like, follow the... Follow the instructions as best you can and see what happens. Hopefully you're on a retreat with a teacher that knows what's going on. You'll have an interview, you go describe what happened. Um, I, I've never tried to work with glimpses or anything. Um, there is a technique of sort of asking for the jhana factors to arrive, which I of course was never able to do because if I ask for the jhana factors arrive, then I just make the jhana arrive, which, you know, <laughs> already knew how to make the genre arise, so it had no real effect. So I, I guess my answer to your question is I don't know. All right, so um, before I ask the next question from the audience, um, I'm curious, uh, so there's been a lot of interest in the chat um, as far as uh, to ask you if you would be interested in leading us in some sort of practice, maybe at the top of the hour for you know whatever amount of time you feel is appropriate. So um, if that seems like a thing you wanna do, there's a lot of interest in that in the chat. Yeah, so I would not be able to lead you into the jhanas. I probably wouldn't even be able to lead you into access concentration. Uh, we'll see how it goes. The, the, the problem with guided meditations is that you don't get as concentrated because you're listening to somebody talking. Uh, you really got to get quiet on your own. But, but 
let's see what it happens what, when we get to the top of the hour. So there's a really great question here um, from Adi. He says, hi, Lee, thank you for the talk. When I was a kid, I remember playing video games with my kid brother, and sometimes I would get the sensation that my hands were becoming huge and dense. In the last few years in my meditation practice, when sitting for 40 to 60 minutes, to my surprise, that sensation started to come back. I did some Googling and found your work. Now, here's my question. I'm deeply curious about going down this rabbit hole out of sheer fascination, but I'm raising two small babies right now. I'm concerned about breaking a fuse, so to speak. Is this a journey that I should revisit once the kids are older, or is there a way to mitigate possible negative or weird effects of practice? Thank you. Okay. okay. The large hands is the common thing, and it's due to concentration. When you're very concentrated, you're simply not processing the signals from your extremities in the usual way. Normally, we have pro proprioceptive. You know, if I say, close your eyes and touch your nose, you can probably do that, right? Because you know where your hand is, you know where your nose is. When you're so focused tightly in on your breath, you're just not processing the signals from your body. So your proprioception just isn't working well. If you've ever seen a drawing of a human where the proportions are corresponding to the amount of nerves in an area. So if you've seen that little homunculus, he's got big hands, big face, big lips, small body, feet get a little bigger. Okay, so you're not picking up the signals in the usual way. And because your hands have more nerves in them, you just start giving them more attention in the background than you normally do and they seem to get big. And it, I don't think it's a problem at all. It's just a, a side effect of concentration. There are other side effects of concentration. Sometimes people lean like this and think they're up straight or they're up straight and think they're leaning like that. Again, proprioception not, not being picked up properly. The other side effect of concentration that I warn people about on every retreat is that once you start fooling with concentration, whether you get to the jhanas or not, if you have any unresolved psychological issues, they might show up. Uh, normally we've got everything under control, but yeah, you focus all of your attention on your concentration. Yeah, stuff pops up. This is very frequent. I warn everybody at the start of every retreat and every retreat, yeah one or two or more people come in with psychological stuff that they thought they'd taken care of showing up. So that's actually more to worry about with concentration practice than distortions in your body. Uh, the distortions in your body, I mean, if, if it's really too weird, just open your eyes, you'll see your hands are their normal size because one, it broke your concentration and two, they were always the normal size. Uh, but yeah, Anything that's powerful yeah, is probably going to have some potential for dangerous side effects, whether it's a chainsaw or meditation. All right. So um, we've got a lot of questions coming in on some similar themes here. So um, I'm not going to ask them in precisely the order that they were um, put in the chat, but one that seems really relevant right now is, um, is a question from... Um, from Rose, uh, which says, um, would you give an example of some of the insights that you've had? Are they expressible? Some are expressible, some are really difficult to express. Um, so the, the, the insights that are really transformative are those into anicca, inconstancy, impermanence, dukkha, unsatisfactory nature of the universe, and anatta, not self. One of the more important insights was really a not self insight. And that was that, you know, there really aren't any nouns. It's just that some verbs move kind of slow. I mean, you think about a wooden table, that's a noun, right? Well, actually it's a point in the history of some trees. If you really look carefully, that wooden table is yeah, it's some dead trees. Can you see those trees? Can you see the forest those trees grew in? Can you see the birds in the trees, the 
roots going into the earth, getting the minerals, the sun, shining the rain. Can you see all of that? Can you see somebody chopping down the trees? Can you see them milling the wood into the lumber and making a table and bringing the table to the store where you bought it? And now at your table, and eventually it's going to wear out and become firewood where it'll get burned and the carbon dioxide will be breathed in by some trees. This non-static view of reality is one of the more important views that I've had. Uh, things are a lot more interconnected, interrelated than they appear on the surface. And yeah, things are changing all the time, not necessarily at human time scales, but everything is in motion. And that's why I say there's no nouns. It's just verbs moving kind of slow. So there's an example. It's a side effect uh, of that. It gives me a chance to mention that I am going to be releasing a book on dependent origination, which actually covers some of that stuff uh, that I just talked about. And I'm hoping it'll go out on Halloween. If you go to my website, leighb.com, if it makes it out on Halloween, you'll find a link. So you can download it for free. It's a free book I'm going to put out. Oh, awesome. Thank you for that. So there's a question that I think would be a good follow-up to that one, um, which is a question from Stephen. So if you'd like to unmute and ask your question, Stephen. Sure, yeah. Uh, my question is around, like, what's your sense of why the jhanas facilitate insights? The, the jhanas leave you when you exit them in a state that is less egocentric, and less distractible. So whatever you turn your mind to, you can see it more clearly because you're looking from an egocentric perspective and you can see it without getting distracted. Mostly when we look at the world, we're looking at it in terms of, can I eat that? Will that eat me? Well, maybe we get a little more sophisticated, but it's about things I want to get or things I want to push away or things I can ignore. Notice I was in all of that. So looking from a less egocentric perspective has a, a really profound ability to help you see things more clearly. And you cannot step as far as the fourth jhana with your ego running loose. It, it just won't work. It just gets quieter and quieter. It goes, sits in the corner. And so when you come out, it doesn't spring back immediately. And so you're looking from an egocentric perspective and you have a mind that's just gotten quiet enough that it's really indistractable. All right, so um, we have a question someone wants me to read for them. Um, Kim's question is, what do you make of spontaneous experiences of the jhanas? Are all experiences the result of practice or do people have spontaneous experiences that then provoke desire for explanation of the experience? All of the above, yes. So a lot of people, when they start practicing and get some concentration going, they'll fall into one of these states. It was really surprising when I started teaching to discover how many people had experienced these states as a child and how many people had experienced them once they you know, started formal meditation practice. For some students, all I'm doing is helping them sort out what they've been experiencing, figuring how to get there on demand as opposed to stumbling into it. Uh, I've known some people who actually have stumbled into all eight of the states. They're pretty rare, uh, but certainly people do stumble into these states. Uh, it's really got to be in meditation before I'm willing to put the word jhana on it. Uh, you can have an experience, an ecstatic experience that would feel very much like, say, the first jhana. You're full of glee and you're really happy, uh, but it's triggered by something external as opposed to your concentrated mind. So one of the keys to the jhanas is that the state arises not due to some external uh, stimulus or even a memory, but arises just because your mind is so concentrated. So I'm going to make that distinction. It's the, the concentration that generates these states that 
makes them into the jhanas. But yeah, I mean, I specifically remember having a luncheon date with a very nice woman. And afterwards, I'm driving back and I come to a stoplight. It's a four way stoplight, you know, one at a time goes. And I'm the first car, I'm right there as it turns red. And I'm going to be sitting there, I know, for over a minute. And I'm just reflecting on the luncheon date. And yeah, within 30 seconds, I was in something that felt exactly like second jhana. I was very happy, but it was triggered by the memory. It wasn't a concentrated mind state. And as soon as the light went green, yeah, it was gone. And so was I. So hopefully that answers the question. I've got a bit of a personal follow-up to that one. Um, <clears throat> uh, trying to zoom in on what you would call the distinction between meditation versus spontaneity with respect to the arising of such experiences. So, um, you know, a as a young child, like maybe six, seven, eight, nine years old, um, every summer we used to drive up to North Carolina from my childhood home in Florida. And, you know, as a kid, I'd get kind of bored by this long car ride. And so I would briefly look well, I uh, admit into the sun, and then I'd get these floaters, these sort of phosphine things, and I'd focus all of my awareness on these, and some very profoundly interesting effects would result from this over time. I'd do this for hours in the car, and, you know, then reading Daniel's book on the fire casino, this seems to be pretty similar to the sort of um, casino practice he's discussing mm -hmm. using a candle flame. So I'm wondering if, you know, as a kid, I know other people that have had similar experiences as children, when, when that happens, and it's sort of spontaneous, but also there's a strong element of playing a game where you're focusing your awareness on some object. Does that feel like it falls more into the meditation side of things for you or into the spontaneous experience side of things for you? I would say that it has elements of meditation, but it was also kind of spontaneous. <laughs> you know, um, one of the things I mentioned in the book, the, the title of the last chapter is don't be fooled by your conceptualizing. So do we wanna conceptualize this as meditation or do we wanna conceptualize this as something spontaneous? Well, it's got elements of both of these. Whatever it was, it was good. And it probably set you up by running the neurological pathway. So when you started playing with the fire casino, boom, you were right back there. So yeah, it was good. And I don't think it's necessary to put it in one category or the other. It had elements of both. Wonderful. So um, I'd like to pivot real quick with the direction of the questioning and say, um, Katie, if you want to unmute yourself and ask either or both of your questions, and that would be oh. great. Hi, Lee. Good Hi. to see you. Um, so it seems like um, Jhanas have been discovered by a bunch of different people in a bunch of different traditions at a bunch of different times. And to me, uh, that makes it easy to draw the conclusion that jhanas are showing us something fundamental about the way the brain works. I like yes. to think that, you know, it's the brain at less and less, doing less and less fabrication. Um, but given that there's something fundamental in the brain that's going on when we're in different jhanic states, I am wondering what you think about using neurostimulation um, as a teaching tool for jhanas. Have you thought about that? What's your take on that? Yeah. So I have meditated for science multiple times, uh, EEG, fMRI. Of course, my attitude is you can look at my brain, but you can't program it. In other words, I don't want you neurologically stimulating it. I want to be able to do it on my own. But yeah, there is a, uh, uh, an experiment going on with uh, Dr. Jay Sanganetti and Shenzhen Young, basically doing neurostimulation to help people with PTSD. And uh, Jay wants me to come to his lab in Arizona and he wants to, yeah, take a look at my brain on jhanas and see what's going on in there with possible thoughts of doing something like that. Um, whether that can be done or not, I don't know. I mean, you know, they have all these little devices where you can, you know, you pay a few hundred dollars and you get a thing to stick on your head and it tells you whether you're meditating well or not. Can we build one that actually stimulates? Uh, or do you have to go to you know, a medical research place and get your mind stimulated to get to the jhanas? 
would having your mind stimulated to get to the jhanas make it easier for you to learn to do it on your own? I mean, these are all wonderful things that we could explore. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. Um, but we don't know enough to know whether it's going to be something that is pursued. The one disadvantage of the jhanas is, yeah, you got to be sort of a serious meditator to be able to access them. Accessing them does seem to be a really helpful thing, even though they do seem to be sort of the natural state for your mind to go into if you get quiet. But you got to learn to get your mind quiet enough for it to happen. Ayakema said that we're not putting the jhanas in there. We're just stopping covering them up. So yeah, these are very naturally occurring states. The, they weren't invented, they were discovered. And the discovery involved getting quiet enough to let your natural mind state show through. And your natural mind state tends to be gleeful, happy, contented, quiet. Yeah, so yeah, being able to touch into these states would be a great thing. It would be very interesting to see, could you stimulate people into these states? And in addition, use that as a way to teach them to enter these states more easily. Great question. Thanks, Lee. Katie, did you wanna ask your other question? Sure, I can ask. I have a practice question too. Um, so, John has required quite a bit of concentration to get into, especially when you're first starting. Uh, and it really helps to go on a retreat or a longer retreat to learn how to touch into the jhanas. Um, but then you go home. Uh, and if you're, if you're a householder, you have all these things to do and take care of. And it can be very hard to do jhana practice as an everyday householder practice, uh, mm -hmm. especially when you're starting. And I'm wondering if you have ideas about what are, say someone wants to be doing more jhana practice, what are particularly effective kind of maintenance practices for them to do when they're at home, not on retreat? Yeah, so there are two things necessary to take the jhanas home. One, learn them on a retreat, and how well do you know them, right? If you're sort of stumbling in, then yeah, it's going to be hard to stumble in at home because of all the householder distractions. So how well do you know them? And the second one, how good is your daily practice? Uh, Ayakema told me an hour in the morning, hour in the evening, if I wanted to keep the jhanas at the same level as on retreat. And I think she was correct, uh, not because that's what I was able to do, but yeah, they started fading, even with an hour every day. You know, the access to them wasn't always there. They weren't as sharp when they were there. I go on the next retreat, they'd come right back to the same level they were on the previous retreat. So the main thing, to, to help your practice continue when you come home is a good daily practice. If you really want it to work, it's gonna be an hour in the morning, hour in the evening. Minimum 45 minutes, five days a week, you, you'll, you'll lose them in a couple of months or maybe you can keep them for six months with that, uh, but they're gonna fade out. An hour a day, pretty much every day, yeah, you'll be able to keep them around. Yeah, I was able to have pretty good access to them for about a year before it really began to get problematic with an hour in the morning, hour in the, with an hour in the morning, almost every day. It wasn't every day, but almost every day. But anything less than that, yeah, it's just, it's just going to fade out. Other things, anything else where you can sit down and turn off all the slings and arrows of outrageous 21st century householder life. You know, just get quiet. Oh, that's called meditation usually. So yeah, anything that anything that simplifies your life. I mean, yeah, you've got enough money, you don't have to work. Great. That's that's gonna reduce a lot of you know inputs and everything else. You live in a quiet place, yeah, that's gonna be helpful. I mean, all these sort of things that would support a meditation practice are gonna support your jhana practice. But the key things are how well you know the practice of the jhanas and how good your daily practice. But you think in terms of like what you're actually doing when you're practicing, if you're if you're doing jhana practice off retreat, that's one thing, but say you're doing, you know, an hour a day, 
do you feel like there's like, you know, Mahasi noting versus doing some kind of like Mahamudra thing? Do you think it matters or as long as you're kind of settling your mind and concentrating, uh, that's effective maintenance? You, you want to do access methods. So the noting practice is too busy. It's not a good access method, all right? Uh, open awareness practice is too open. It's not a good access method. So yeah, work with the breath, work with metta, work with the body scan, work with the mantra, work with the nada sound, the, the, the access method practices. Yeah, that's what's gonna be required. Yeah, uh, open awareness, Mahasi noting are very good insight practices. Yeah, step into your favorite one after you've gotten some degree of concentration, even if you didn't get to the jhanas. You know, sit down and work with your breath for a while. Or sit down and do a half an hour of, med of metta meditation. And then, yeah, do your chosen insight practice. So that brings me to another question I had for you that I was just reminded of by that exchange, which is on the relationship between uh, jhanas and concentration more broadly and metta practice. Um, I know in my own personal experience, I find sort of a, uh, a thing happens where I find it very useful to sort of, I kind of think of it as powering up a metta practice by doing some, some concentration and hopefully a jhanic type practice first, and then transitioning into the more traditional um, style of metta practice. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts about whether that's effective or any other suggested orderings with respect to concentration and then um, metta practices. Yeah, I've played with both metta as the access method to get to the first jhana, and I've played with metta post jhana, and both of them are excellent. Uh, you could even do both of them in the same sitting. You use metta to get to the jhanas, you run through the jhanas, and you return to doing the metta. I've played with going, trying to do metta and maintain a jhana in the background, sort of, you know, task switching. And I found that was quite interesting. Uh, it took me, it wasn't, I didn't stay in the jhana. It took me to a different state. So we yeah, have any way that you want to play with metta in relation to the jhana seems to work quite well. Another sort of practice ordering question we have from the group is um, Jan's question um, on uh, the ordering of, of practices. So Jan, do you want to unmute yourself and ask that question now? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's about, it's a personal question, you know, in the sense that I believe I sometimes get to access concentration. Um, but I, I think I've, I mean, I've experienced PT, but not in a reliable way. Um, and so would you recommend to, you know, like, is that good enough access concentration for doing insight? Or would you recommend like, um, uh, in general, you know, like putting some effort on concentration for a while? Or is that something that cannot be answered in a generic way? Yeah, so any degree of concentration you can get is going to be helpful for insight practice. Access concentration good enough to give you PT, yeah, that's going to be more helpful than following your breath for three minutes or something like that. So, um, yeah, I would say generate as much concentration as you can, given the time constraints on the length of your sitting. I mean, you, you may sit down with the idea, oh, I'll just sit until, you know, I've got plenty of time, I can sit for several hours, but your body's going to get tired of sitting and then you know, it's all going to fall apart. So you sit down and you say, all right, I've got an hour. What I tell students is, yeah, spend half the time getting concentrated and half the time doing insight practice and getting to access concentration well enough to have PT manifest. Yeah, that's good concentration. It will definitely help your, your insight practice. As for learning the jhanas at home, yeah, that's really hard. Some people do manage and I'm impressed. I could have never learned them at home. Uh, most people need to go on like a 10 day retreat or longer. To, to actually be able to learn the jhanas. But access concentration at home, definitely. Most everybody, given sufficient time, say a half an hour of working with the breath and not a lot of stuff coming at you from your daily life, you, you can get, yeah, you can get to access concentration and then start your insight practice. Thank you.
And we've got another practice question from Pranab that's on a topic sort of near and dear to my heart as well. So Pranab, if you want to um, unmute and ask your question. Sure. Uh, thanks, Lee. How do you relate to non-dual practice, um, similar to Mahamudra or Dzogchen style uh, in mm -hmm. the job, um, either with ordering or how they interplay? Thanks. Yeah, so my favorite insight practice is Dzogchen, all right? So yeah, get concentrated and then open out, open up. Um, it's a very good insight practice. Uh, yeah. The, the world isn't dual, you know, there is only the universe and all the bits and pieces that we experience of the universe are just our little pea brains having to chop it up into bits and pieces uh, because we can't handle the entire universe at once. It's a practical thing to do, but it's actually really important to get the sense of yeah, the non-dual nature of the universe. So um, what I find is that coming out of the jhanas, you know, I've gotten my mind really quiet, and then open up to a non-dual practice. It's much easier to stay there. Um, Lama Suridas said that Rigpa, which is the mind state of Dzogchen, had three characteristics. Uh, no artifact, so no object or anything like that. No distraction and no effort. And so to do the no distraction, no effort part, yeah, once you come out of the jhanic states and open up like that, then your mind is much less likely to get distracted. I find that if I sit down and start doing Dzogchen practice in my daily practice just immediately, it's a lot of distraction. You know, it's, it's really low quality. But if I'll get my mind quieter and do it, yeah, maybe, maybe it'll go much better. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and a quick follow-up to that that came up in my head. Uh, I don't have much, I don't have really any experiential uh, experience with this, but I'm curious, theoretically, uh, it sounds, there's, it seems like there's a similarity between jhanas five through eight and uh, that's that Dokchen state. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, a lot of people bring up the seeming similarity. So jhanas five through eight, each one of them has a very particular object and you have a really tight focus on that object. That's, that's all that's going on. In the open awareness practice, there's no tight focus and there's no specific object. In fact, the whole idea is to step beyond subject and object. So the fundamental nature of the two is really different. But in fifth jhana, big space, in, well, sky gazing Dzogchen practice, big space. So there is that similarity there. It's not that they're complete opposites, but the real defining feature of each of them, John is a tight focus and uh, open awareness, no tight focus. Yeah, that's really, really different. Thank you. All right. So, um... We're past the top of the hour, so I want to check in with you and see, do you think it would be um, uh, a better use of our time to have you lead us in a practice if you were willing, or would you prefer to continue taking some questions? Um, I think either one makes sense from my perspective. I think I'd rather do the questions. I mean, I mean, for the practice, I'm going to say, all right, sit down, close your eyes, put your attention on the tactile sensations of your breath. <laughs> Uh, all right, after this is over, you want to practice? You just got the instructions. Go do that. So questions. All right. So uh, Max, you had a couple of questions about the nature of awakening, if you want to unmute yourself and ask them. Hello, Lei. Um, okay. Could you describe in simple terms uh, what exactly is enlightenment? <laughs> and uh, what does that change in a person when uh, they achieve it? What is the changing? What is the change uh, that uh, an external person might notice in someone who's been enlightened or, yeah. in, or in oneself? So the Buddha said, I teach dukkha and the end of dukkha. So for the Buddha, awakening, because that's the word he used rather than enlightenment. Enlightenment's a translation of bodhi, which literally means awakening. So awakening is a 
reconfiguring your brain so that you no longer react to the stimulus that you receive in such a way that you generate dukkha. Uh, I like to translate dukkha as bummer, right? So when there is uh, sensory input, it no longer generates you becoming bummed out. So that's how I would define it based on what the Buddha said, that uh, no matter what happens, you're able to process it and deal with it in a way that you don't get bummed out, you don't experience it as dukkha. To get a little more specific, it's the overcoming of greed, hatred, and delusion. Uh, kind of easy to tell when you're being greedy if you pay attention. It's kind of easy to tell when you're being aversive if you're paying attention. Uh, almost impossible to tell you're deluded until you get undiluted because you're deluded into thinking you're not deluded. So that, that one's more tricky. But yeah, awakening is basically installing a new default such that your reaction doesn't go into, uh, well, selfing. Um, normally when we don't have anything to do, what we run is the default mode network in our brain. You can look this up on Wikipedia, just plug in default mode network. It's uh, a network in your brain that ties together multiple parts of the brain that are associated with the sense of self. And so, yeah, when you don't have anything to do, that's what runs. When you're trying to meditate and you get distracted, it's because your default mode network came online. One thing you might notice is when you're distracted, how often the word I, me, or mine is prominent in your distraction. I mean, sometimes you're remembering a movie that you watched or you know something like that, but a lot of the times you're planning for the future or remembering the past, and you're the star in both of those scenarios. So I would say, that I would guess that we're rewiring our brain when we become awakened. I mean, you're rewiring your brain all the time. Uh, you learn anything new, you rewired your brain. So there's a rewiring of the brain that takes place, and I would suspect that you install a new default. Uh, in particular, I would think that the new default would be mindfulness. If there's nothing to do, you're just mindful of the present. I say this based on a sutta. It's uh, Sutta Nipata 5.15, Mogaraja's questions. He asks, how must one view the world so that the king of death cannot see one? And the Buddha says, view the world as empty, ever mindful. If you don't go conceiving of a self, you may be one who overcomes death and the king of death cannot see you. So empty in the sense that everything is dependently originated. Everything is without an essence. It all arises, to, everything is arising dependent on everything. On Everything arises dependent on other things and it's enough interconnected that it's just one thing. That's the empty nature. Ever mindful, don't run your default mode network, just pay attention to what's happening in the here and now. You won't then conceive of a self and maybe you overcome death. So that's, I think, the Buddhist description of Nibbana and what it's gonna take. So is it uh, the consequence of achieving the eight uh, jhana? that you connect with everything and uh, then yep. you are able to be beyond uh, your own self? The jhanas are just sharpening your knife. You didn't get it really any insights. You just mm -hmm. got it sharp. You've got to go out and wield that to cut through the bonds of ignorance, as they mm -hmm. say. Uh, Manjushri in the Tibetan tradition has a sword. Yeah, you're just sharpening Manjushri's sword. You still got to go wield it. Being in these states, it's cool. It's, yeah, it's unique. It's, it's kind of fun, right? But you didn't get any insight into the nature of reality. You're actually going to have to investigate reality post jhana to get towards awakening. Okay, thank you. 
So I'll throw another question into the ring here, since I believe your background includes some um, software engineering and computer science. Um, one thing that I find fascinating is the degree to which people who um, who are credibly seen as as uh, awakened, um, you know, still still manifest uh, fairly conventional personalities, um, you know, in a way that seems to be in some level of conflict with some of the stories from the old days of these, you know. Um, extremely uh, pure type people. And so um, some people in the chat have been discussing um, the metaphor of awakening as sort of like installing a new OS. So I want to take that and run with it for a second and ask, um, first of all, do you, do you think that's a decent metaphor for um, what awakening sort of looks like um, running a different OS? And then secondly, if we do like that metaphor, it sort of suggests to me the, the further metaphor of uh, a hypervisor. So basically running your previous personality in a sort of virtual machine. I'm wondering if that clicks for you at all. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's down at the OS level. I think the OS is still pretty much the same, but you deleted all the old programs and you install some new ones, right? Um, it's, it's, you, you kept some of the old programs because some of the old programs are fine, right? There's nothing wrong with a DOS box. I mean, okay, it still works, but you, you've got a much better word processor and it doesn't crash all the time. It doesn't keep injecting me whenever you paste something in, right? So I, I would say that you still got the same OS, but you have much higher quality programs that are running. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's probably a better way to look at it. Uh, now, as for personality, you read the suttas and the Buddha had a personality. I mean, it's, it's definitely there. You can tell he was an aversive type. Well, duh, he, he became awakened investigating dukkha. I mean, his whole idea was, how do I get out of dukkha? You know, a greed type's not going to go investigate dukkha. A greed type's going to go find some pleasure. So the Buddha's an aversive, and he's looking for how to deal with dukkha. Yeah, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But you see his personality there. So people, awakened ones, still have personality. The question today in 21st century Western civilization, who is actually fully awakened? People have awakening experiences, but fully awakened? Yeah, uh, I'm not gonna name names because I don't know any names to name. Um, sometimes I encounter people who claim to be fully awakened and I'll poke them and see how they respond. Do they get bummed out? Do they have a negative reaction, you know? And then I ask them about that. Yeah, they don't like that. So anyhow, uh, whether somebody else is awakened or not, um, actually it's kind of immaterial. The question is, are you awakened or not? If not, you've got more work to do. Where can you find people that are actually giving you good instructions, all right? Um, that's the key thing. And yeah, fully awakened people, unfortunately, seem to be in limited supply in 21st century Earth. So that actually leads me to another question that's been sort of uh, on my mind throughout this conversation, um, which is, it has to do with the sort of um, sense of historical association between uh, jhana cultivation practice and uh, what are often referred to as the cities. Um, this seems to be a, an area of fascination for a lot of people, the so-called extraordinary powers, which uh, can theoretically be gained through, among other things, jhana or specifically kasina practice, according to um, the Vasudhimaga according, uh, and other texts. So I'm curious as to if you have thoughts on the cities um, and their relationship or lack thereof to uh, jhanic practice. So certainly the suttas indicate coming out of the fourth jhana, instead of doing your insight practice, you can, you can create a man-made body. You can walk on water, fly through the air, walk through walls, you know, all that sort of stuff. 
You can know the minds of others. You can hear sounds at a distance. You can remember past lives and you can see beings passing away and re-arising according to your karma. Okay. So a mind-made body. Uh, I go into detail of this in my book. I think the mind-made body is uh, what's called wake-induced lucid dreaming. It's learning a technique to go from an ordinary state of consciousness, well, a somewhat altered state of consciousness, directly into a lucid dream without having to fall asleep, start dreaming, recognize that you're dreaming, in other words, becoming lucid, and then start manipulating it. So the state you need is very similar to what you get coming out of fourth jhana. Oh, yeah, right? So the mind-made body is entering a lucid dream. And what do you do in a lucid dream? How about walk on water, fly through the air, pass through walls and ramparts in, unimpeded? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say all that stuff is simply lucid dreaming. There is a sutta. It's number... It's in the... Numerical Discourses, book three, number 60, where a Brahmin says basically that these miracles, like walking on water, flying through the air, only benefit the one who does them. In other words, it sounds like a private experience, and the Buddha agrees. He says the only miracle that counts is the miracle of instruction, which actually is a miracle. I mean, I'm sitting here exhaling, flapping a piece of loose skin in my throat, throwing sound waves at this computer. It's coming out of your computer and hopefully you're learning something. That's kind of miraculous. That's the only miracle that counts, right? So that's the first two, mind-made body and walking on water, etc. The next two, uh, knowing the minds of others and hearing sounds at a distance, this is ESP. Science says it doesn't know what ESP is. It can't detect it. But when I say ESP, extrasensory perception, you know what I'm talking about. There is a phenomenon, whether it's just people not being very good at math for the odds of things happening or fooling themselves or whatever, it is easier to do that with a really concentrated mind. Uh, people who practice the jhanas do notice that they seem to have more ESP than they normally do, whatever ESP is. So we don't have to worry about what ESP is. The phenomena that goes by that name is more available if you're well concentrated. And then remembering past lives and seeing beings passing away and re-arising according to their karma. Stephen Batchelor in one of his books uh, has a really, really excellent uh, take on that. And I'm going to see if I can find it right quick. Uh, I have to bring up my Kindle, go to the library. Uh, and double click. And it appears I have to find the bookmark. So here's Stephen from his book, After Buddhism. This critical assessment of the doctrines of rebirth and karma risk overlooking a crucially important role that they have played in historical Buddhist cultures. To dismiss them as unverifiable metaphysical beliefs of a former age fails to recognize how they serve to situate human life within a vision of the cosmos. Rather than conceiving of one's life as a brief flicker of self-interested consciousness on the surface of the earth, people with these beliefs could see in the mythic language of their time how all living beings are intimately connected to a complex series of causal conditions that preceded their existence, as well as to a seemingly infinite unfolding of future consequences for which each was in some small way responsible. This is really brilliant on Stephen's part. I particularly like his book, After Buddhism, and I would highly recommend it. But yeah, looking at remembering past lives, seeing beings passing away and re-arising according to their karma, as the way that the Buddha could connect with the people in his culture about these things, 
rather than try and come directly at them with this inexpressible vision of, you know, an interconnected universe that he was able to say, look, this is what you're all thinking about. Get a bigger picture of it. And so that's the cities from my standpoint. Um, one other thing to, to mention on those first ones, the walking on water and so forth, if you practice these, it will give you a sense of, yeah, the world is not as solid as we think it is. The way that we're making it up with all of our conceptualizing is just our interpretation of what's going on. And it's possible to make up anything you want in your wake induced lucid dream. And that may give you some hints to step beyond your normal way of conceptualizing the universe. Thank you for that um, very wonderful answer. Um, really appreciate that. So I think we're basically at the end of our time together here. So I'll make some closing announcements in a moment, but um, I wonder Lee, if you have anything to uh, leave us with any final thoughts before we close out the session. Yeah, so there was a request for a meditation. So we're gonna do a meditation right now, right quick. So close your eyes, put your attention on your breathing. Now, do you like being happy? Is being happy a good thing? You, you, you appreciate it when you're happy? Yeah. Can you get in touch with the fact that you like to be happy? You like it when your friends are happy? Is that a good thing? Yeah, may, may my friends be happy. What if all your acquaintances were happy? What if the people you ran into in the stores, on the street, at work, your neighbors, what if they were all happy? Wouldn't that be nice? May all my acquaintances be happy. What if the difficult people in your life were happy? Maybe they wouldn't be so difficult. May the difficult people in my life be happy. What if everybody on this little planet was happy? Wouldn't that be nice? I want to live on a planet like that where everybody's happy. May all beings everywhere be happy. So I'll just leave you with the fact that it's really important to be kind to each other. We're living in some pretty crazy ter ter turmoil, tumultuous times. We've got a global pandemic on and that's not the number one problem is global warming. And we've got to work together to solve both of these problems. That's the thought I'll leave you with. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. And thank you. Um, the, I think I speak not only for myself here and saying it's been a, a real pleasure to have you on the STOA and a, and a wonderful session. So thank you uh, again for your time, Lee. And um, this has been been absolutely great. Um, a couple closing announcements. Uh, later today at um, 6 p.m., um, we have a session called A Guide to Green Burial with uh, Caitlin Haug. Um, so this will be discussing how to have an eco-friendly, ethical, and compassionate green burial, um, some resonance with a Buddhist uh, practice there looking at the death process. So if anyone's interested in that, you can sign up for that on the stoa.ca. And again, thank you, uh, Lee, for, for joining us today. And uh, thank everyone for uh, attending and all the wonderful questions today. It's, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, so... Uh, that will close out for today. Very much. I really appreciated the invitation. It's been fun.